start recording the lecture. So welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to the live lecture and uh, thank you also for joining later uh, via the, the recordings. So uh, today uh, we are approaching our uh, the final moments of our our module evolutionary economic geography. In today's lecture, we'll cover uh, the parts that we couldn't uh, covered uh, last Tuesday, and uh, we'll bring um, an additional insights on another regional policy uh, targeting regional developments or intended to support regional development. Uh, again, um, primarily focus on the on the on in Europe and mainly within the European Union context, but uh, but a policy that has been uh, already implemented or at least designed elsewhere elsewhere in the world, but the literature still remaining uh, um, remaining uh, behind in exploring these other other cases within a smart specialization strategies that the police the policy I'm uh, talking about here. Okay, th so let's let's first uh, embrace. Uh, a little recap of a previous lecture within strategic coupling, which then will pave the way to uh, the smart specialization strategies. Uh, again, focus in the in the European Union uh, context. And uh, next week, our final lecture, I will bring uh, um, somehow new approaches within economic geography, eventually a little, a little bit close to sustainability preoccupations and uh, some other alternatives of, of exploring uh, some of the concepts we have been we have been discussing throughout these um, these ten lectures, I will be talking about Tigro a little. Uh, I will be talking about uh, also a little circular economy, slow innovation processes, and um, global value chains, but not in the in a in a in a very very um, classic in a classic manner, but more uh, open up. Um, uh, ways of thinking about the global value chains within uh, sustainability principles or, or more focus on the environmental size of sustainability. And then we talk about uh, in the previous lecture about uh, um, strategic coupling at the end, before that regional attractiveness strategies and before that uh, or linked to these attractiveness strategies, place-based attractiveness strategies, we talk about place-based branding strategies, uh, also elsewhere called it the territorial marketing, place marketing strategies, and before that, strategic special planning. And, uh, uh, and uh, here I underline more this critical side of the of these regional attractiveness strategies. Ideally, if they start from a planning process and, and uh, understanding it, this planning process at a territorial level, regional, national, or more local uh, level planning, if embraced and explored in the in the in the in the in the way that the conceptualization proposes through participation, then then these regional attractiveness strategies will have a, a, a more a more coherent, a more a more um, a credible uh, designing process, and eventually the implementation will be less prone to critics. However, currently uh, much uh, much of these uh, original attractiveness strategies at the national level, for example, uh, or place branding strategies, they are very prone to critics, uh, fundamentally in the less developed territories or less developed regions. If we think about the European context, uh, uh, this, this, the, the critics go in a, the direct, more in the direction of uh, uh, environmental preservation uh, to that extent attracting business uh, or, or the trade-offs between attracting business, for example, and uh, and uh, landscape conservation, conservation of uh, natural landscapes, in context of less developed territories, such as in uh, in parts of Africa or Latin America, or other less developed regions, still lagging behind in in uh, economic and social indicators. This is very uh, can be very controversial, seeing uh, national governments or regional governments developing these regional attractiveness strategies often supported through branding process. And I bring here just examples that I, I they had they have been I've been thinking about them recently. Fundamentally this one in Angola, uh, ex-Portuguese colony in the in the southern part of Africa that 
currently is investing uh, certainly quite a lot of money in promoting the country for investments in the agribusiness sector by um, placing themselves or positioning themselves as a land of opportunity and all these these advertisements and unfortunately some of these the, the outputs of these uh, regional attractiveness strategies or branding strategies they they are uh, mainly based on catchy slogans or colorful uh, catchy slogans and colorful um, uh, um, colorful slogans and catchy uh, taglines and they they do not go much far behind behind these um, these uh, these outputs, the de this design. Other controversial examples can be also identified um, elsewhere. And um, yeah, uh, welcome, uh, welcome Rua to the um, to the to the lecture. Uh, no problem at all. Um, so continuing on the on this on this uh, this dimension. What I've what I, I I have been dis debating in some of my previous publications. That's not, this is not a topic I'm currently focused on, place branding or attractiveness strategies. Uh, but when I was doing research in uh, in this in these levels, I always find it very controversial seeing the countries investing large amounts of money, often public money, in trying to attract business without having a clear planning supporting it and without having a preoccupation of improving these assets, uh, those they can improve the tangible ones, the infrastructures before advancing towards uh, a regional attractiveness strategies before advancing to uh, attract, trying to attract businesses or, um, or workforce. Uh, I argue in some of my, of my publications and some of them, uh, I am a, a co-author, not, not the first author. So these are ideas also shared by other colleagues is that first a country, a region, a territory needs to be planned to be managed. This implies a lot of work across the governance structures and then they can use these strategies to tell to the world that they are doing something different. They are trying to improve the, the infrastructures of the country. They are trying to, to reshape and renew, for example, the industrial sector and trying to position and to embrace a, a more technological approach or embracing the knowledge economy. But then they will use this these strategies to communicate to the outside world. They are working on a structural change or they are implementing a number of measures through different kinds of policies to bring about some change and not the other way around in advancing with these communication strategies that we can, can place this branding and attractiveness strategy as a part of the communication strategy before improving the country. And, other, and there are also other issues. Uh, involving involving this kind of communication strategies. So we argue, myself and other colleagues, that this needs to be integrated in wider spatial planning and also be aligned with sectorial planning from the industrial sector, for example, is that is a governance exercise. It requires the involvement of a large number of actors, public and private enterprises, they should also play a role in the, in the definition, in the design, in the preparation of these branding strategies. So in the end, there are a number of uh, uh, arguments in the literature in support of this co-creation process of branding or regional attractiveness strategies and or co-production uh, uh, co processes of, um, of similar strategies. And um, what I want to call your attention uh, in this moment is that within the literature of uh, economic geography, the, the mainstream literature within economic geography, we'll see less uh, comments or, or less arguments um, within place branding than the, the body of literature is placed between planning, place management, urban studies, critical urban geography as well. Uh, and we'll see more the discussions around regional attractiveness strategies, uh, position, positioning strategies. So these are the concepts that will appear uh, more often within the economic geography literature that you have in your whole art platform or many others that you can find via uh, a search within um, these um, uh, common databases. So the place prints that the, 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 the core argument at indeed they have the capability of providing something for everybody within a society uh, from the uh, social domains to the more economic uh, oriented ones because or only because when they are created by everybody. So uh, um, 
the effectiveness or if we can measure the effectiveness uh, of a place branding strategy similar to a regional attractiveness strategy if they are the result of a of 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 a um, integrated process a coordination uh, involving different type of of stakeholders and again here the key elements that uh, a number of uh, has this uh, investigating place branding strategies point the direction is that the role of place branding again is not about promoting uh, a territory promoting the, uh, the assets of that country uh, but is more about communicating to the outside world they are doing something to improve the structure of that uh, that place so this this the effectiveness here of these branding strategies uh, or a branding schedule won't become really effective if it is not supported through a wider um, spatial planning processes in uh, alignment with a, a more sectorial level planning. That's what is then uh, underlining in this um, in this definition. And uh, this is prone to different kind of critics from uh, uh, multidisciplinary domains, from economic geography, critical urban geography, sociology as well. And then some of the critics go in line in, in this type of directions. Our country that's still lagging behind in terms of, of uh, human development indicators, for example. And if we compare in the past 20 years, the evolution of, of this human development indicator, although it's only indicator, okay, we can criticize in this regarding as well the, the, the truly usefulness of these indicators, but then the, 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 the evolution has been really, really uh, a minor, a minor th past uh, the 20 years, how they can invest in these large amounts of money in attracting, in, in putting in place these uh, attractiveness strategies, trying to attract uh, investments while the population still lagging behind in many of the, the, the conditions that we consider fundamental and prime uh, while living in society. And we can also argue, all right, but then they have, they have to find a starting point. Uh, maybe attracting business will then generate generate higher levels of development than, than the then they can, can, can contribute to job creation or retain populations in specific parts of, of the country as well. Indeed, this can occur, but also uh, some of the recent evidence, uh, empirical based evidence shows that these uh, investments purely based on uh, multinational corporations with headquarters elsewhere that try to invest in these uh, frontier territories, so territories that are uh, open to to different types of uh, of businesses, then the multi the the synergies they create and the value the added value to the territory are very very uh, they reach a very minor scale. Then they the, the 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 truly impact at the ground is really is really really few and not the what they expect to to receive so it's necessary to embrace these uh, these uh, different ways of thinking when we are we are considering uh, the truly effectiveness of such attractiveness strategies these more in less developed territories and the, in another context we can also question the the uh, the effectiveness of such of such strat strategies fundamentally those focus on attracting for example talented uh, workforce are highly qualified or workforce uh, to countries that's still lagging behind in this type of uh, of uh, qualified uh, qualified employers and it is questioned the, the the atrocities against human rights for example in saudi arabia they have a, a a serious campaign to attract investment to saudi arabia the same goes uh, for qatar for example and then in this case in this case, I'm aware that they uh, try to align this investment strategy with a more um, overarching planning process to the country towards 2030, but that we still almost uh, um, in daily basis hearing about uh, about uh, complaints against uh, human rights and here in, the, in this uh, um, a press release from the European, European Parliament calling for a, a more fair treatment of Ethiopian migrants in uh, Saudi Arabia. So this is to... to my intention here is to um, to 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 bring these these different different uh, vectors uh, uh, 
different vectors when we are we are researching a certain aspect or thinking about the usefulness the applicability uh, of a certain a certain a certain strategy intended to support ultimately intended to support the regional development there is always a number of elements that we should be aware of while exploring such a such topic being this in a more academic terms or, or, or in the in a practice one if then if you are called to engage with policy oriented studies for example so these slides are very intended to summarize that component of the previous lecture and then we somehow cut short the the comparison between uh, uh, between um, Siemens, uh, the healthcare sector of Siemens, uh, and the strategic coupling in China, and the Huawei uh, strategic coupling process or, or the integration of Huawei, the Chinese telecommunication uh, multinational telecommunication multinational corporation in Europe. And we'll explore this uh, later on. And uh, we underline that this strategic coupling, this, this linkage or connectedness involving uh, multinational corporations that, that, that the global production networks only exist because these multinational corporations and transnational corporations uh, uh, are placed, are global enterprises. And then, then, then all together, they, they are, can be classified as global production networks. The strategic coupling is a central concept within these global production networks. And the strategic coupling is about the interactions that exist between these multinational corporations. And I know that you also, some of you, you heard about these concepts earlier in other, in other disciplines or in other modules. So this is about the interaction of these multinational corporations within a local economy. Here understood as a, as a national economy, as a regional economy, it very much depends on the, on the markets uh, where these multinational corporations are positioned. And, uh, and ultimately, the prime goal of this strategic coupling is to fulfill strategic needs of both of the enterprises, of the corporations, of the firms um, that they are embedded within a certain industrial ecosystem and also satisfy uh, in full or partly the needs of the local economy, of a regional economy. And um, the more sympathetic literature, and you find these types of, uh, of literature, some of them, they put it, put it uh, um, straightforward at the beginning that they assume a sympathetic view of this or that concept, uh, uh, a point that I often, um, I also supported putting forward uh, our views. If we embrace a more environmental uh, way of thinking, we shall put this forward at the beginning of, of our, our writings that we embrace a more sustainability preoccupation while exploring this topic. And some of these researchers, they underline they are sympathetic towards this concept and they justify it as being a, as being a fundamental component in support of uh, regional development, supporting the social and economic developments of, of territories because it implies an engagement and a number of arrangements across the governance structures and understand this in terms terms of institutional arrangements and, uh, and often implies also boosting the, the capacity of these institutions in a certain territory. So that, that the, the core principle of this strategic coupling is to boost uh, the value creation within the regional economy. But on one hand, there is the uh, that is that there are there are the, the needs of the enterprises and ultimately these are related to profit making and then the needs of the regional economies and this is difficult to grasp in terms of practice as well as most of these concepts we have been discussing here and and uh, and uh, and at, at the end not all the the all the goals or the expectations uh, behind the preparation of strategic coupling process are fully achieved by both enterprises and uh, and uh, and the regions and uh, so we could short uh, the the lecture because of the time and now explore a little bit the process process of the embeddedness of the Huawei in Europe so similar to Siemens there are some similarities and some differences between Siemens and Huawei. So they both uh, follow very much the same path, the same evolutionary uh, path in terms of embeddedness and embeds in their respective local economies, uh, Siemens in China and Huawei in Europe. However, 
while reading this part of the literature, uh, we can almost consider as a, as a, as a part of common sense that Siemens is a well-established enterprise with solid roots in Europe and in, a, the, in the developed world, while uh, Huawei is, is less, less known in Europe and also in other parts of the world. So we could anticipate different types of challenges within this embeddedness. And then we are talking about an enterprise that uses uh, with know-how technology built uh, or made in Europe, which per se also plays a role in, 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 a, in, a, in in the branding of the whole enterprise. So coming from Europe is already an advantage or gives to Siemens an advantage in comparison to, to others. So we call hypothesize at the beginning, for example, of certain research, well, certainly Siemens will find, um, we, we will uh, will encounter less difficulties in trying to achieve this embeddedness in the local economy in the comparison to to uh, to other uh, other enterprises from China or from uh, uh, other um, less less traditional uh, investors in the in Europe, for example. So they follow more or less the same process: exploratory embeddedness, establishing strategic linkage, then strategic embeddedness. And then finally, the strategic coupling, and we'll see that the coupling of both is slightly different. They start by uh, lower hand customers in very specific markets. In the case, uh, first one was the Russian one, and then Eastern part of Europe, and they gradually start turning these lower hand customers to, to targeting more large and medium sized enterprises as, as their prime uh, customers. So they start by engaging with less challenging markets in terms of, uh, of, of uh, or taxes, in terms of legislation as well. And uh, as, as a way to, to start uh, also gaining a, a position in terms of, of uh, name, brand, actually also and then they start conquering more challenging markets in the central in the in, in central europe fundamentally uh, this was this this was part of that exploratory embeddedness since 1996 uh, in europe so similar in terms of uh, the the theoretical framework you can uh, uh, theoretical slash empirical based framework you can you can and uh, you can um, uh, draw here for one wise similar to the one uh, of Siemens. so they first try to to explore the market and they gradually in the co in the evolutionary perspective they start cementing their presence in europe and to until until they called truly call that um, uh, that embeddedness a strategic coupling process so and this still is still an ongoing process very similar to other case to the case of Siemens is still an ongoing process so they start also from uh, less competitive less challenging markets to more advanced ones in Central Europe and you know what I'm talking about German market Austrian market French uh, French market the Benelux market as well so they start by 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 entering Europe from the from Eastern Europe and and uh, reaching out different markets through different uh, strategies and uh, in both cases they are we, we can clearly position them in terms of evolutionary process they 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 start they start uh, by exploring both markets and they evolve through time they they, they start establishing different types of linkage with institutions they start investing themselves in upgrading their uh, their intervention in the market or uh, in the case of Siemens from the from delivering um, or providing services and, and and selling products to the uh, physical production production of the healthcare components in China and similar with uh, uh, Huawei more about service delivery and Huawei started uh, their 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 strategic uh, that the entry in the European market from the Russian uh, from the from from Russia from the Russian market and then Eastern Europe and then the rest of the of Europe and currently their goal is to to use Europe and use Europe to boost that image as an enterprise and take Huawei as a, as a European based multinational corporation, which will then play a role in their intentions to advance to other 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 markets, certainly the North American market. So they will use Europe to boost their, their image as well. 
and everything but everything was quite quite it happens in the in the in the in the long term process not 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 in the short term of one year or, or two years. They first start by establishing a different kind of protocols at the highest level of, of the governance you can find involving the, the, the national governance of both countries as this picture illustrate, establishing a protocols and, and cooperation, uh, business cooperation agreements with a Moscow uh, mobile telecommunication system, for example. And then from Russia, they enter the European market, the core European in uh, uh, the core of Europe, the Central Europe, by establishing a research and development center in Stockholm in 2000 by, uh, with the prime goal of enhancing uh, the, co the company's core uh, competence. But certainly, that, certainly there are a number of details that should not be neglected if you are embracing a, a research in this domain, for example, and, uh, and a number of, of uh, of um, uh, references provide different type of insights that uh, I'm not going through them. What is important here is that this is a evolutionary process. It takes time until a multinational corporation, if you will start thinking about generalizing, to truly entry, uh, integrate or, uh, uh, or, or, or embed themselves in a specific market and more challenging in one in where the regulations in terms of competitiveness and, uh, and um, uh, competitiveness in terms of legislation as well as competition uh, involving different type of enterprises is is so rooted within uh, within the economy as in Europe for example so they start establishing by by starting their and that embedness through signing contracts so I'm uh, here in comparison I, I while while again while, while exploring this literature while the Siemens case uh, uh, as, as, as you go along your readings, you'll start finding a, a connection between the business and the local economy through institutions. I, uh, I, my analysis of the Huawei case is, 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 tell, tells me that is very much the heifer of the business side mainly. So uh, probably they, they start finding a lot of, of barriers, entry barriers, which is a topic within a, uh, within a management studies, uh, for example, they start certainly finding a number of barriers and this evolution through time is, is I find it very much business, uh, a, 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 the business commitment of Huawei in truly entering the European market. Probably at some point, they may start thinking about giving up on the market, but then they start finding ways to really conquer the market, the European market, and they, they, they start doing it by signing contracts uh, with, different, uh, uh, with different countries or with different uh, telecommunication companies in Europe. So that's, that was, this was part of their strategy, very much business oriented and the result of, a strong, of, a, of their, their strong commitment towards, towards their goal, entering the European market and using the European market to then position themselves as a global company. Neil? Uh, like yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I was thinking about a recent case in, in the news with the uh, big Tesla manufacturer in eastern Germany. Uh, in I don't know the, the Bundesland right now. I think in Brandenburg. Yeah. Is Brandenburg. Yeah. And is it the same like um, Tesla started having a connection with Germany by just selling products and now it's starting to create linkages in Germany to really seize the market by uh, creating a manufacturing uh, facility here in Germany? Uh, is a recent case, so I, I couldn't find I couldn't find Tesla among the literature I searched. But certainly, based on what you are telling me, it sounds very much a, a similar process of exploratory, uh, starting from 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 a, a low a low let's call it a low level of intervention to a more a, a more evolved a more a more innovative process within the embeddedness in Germany. It sounds indeed a very similar, a very similar process of, of, of Tesla. What's, uh, well, based on my knowledge, what I, Tesla already holds a consolidated position in the mind of consumers as well as in the mind of uh, policy makers. So it may find a more favorable territory 
to evolve quite quickly from a, a, an exploratory phase if we apply this conceptual framework from uh, from the literature maybe it it will find the easier the the path will be easier for tesla because it's already uh, uh, the image of tesla is already somehow consolidated in the european market i don't know if you agree if you disagree have you ever heard about Huawei? i don't know five years ago or or they, they are in the european market since 1996 but i i only start hearing about Huawei quite quite recently i don't know if, if Huawei is in your mind since since long time ago and this also plays a role in that in that in that embeddedness process so we talk about embeddedness and then there is different steps along the path what you are telling me about tesla sounds very similar to both cases the siemens and the Huawei. they are exploring entering through a lower level and you said they are specifically in the in the in the how do you call this the in the in the in the urban region in a lens uh, sorry i'm is failing me the word in no a... i i was saying that they uh, <clears throat> started to have a strategic linkage like mm -hmm. the second phase of the strategy like, yes uh by by starting to build the manufacturer manufacturing mm -hmm. in the countryside of brandenburg yeah, exactly that's so so they are they are specific located yet in in a in a yeah in a specific territory and then certainly with the intentions of continuing that grow process and maybe after building that that factory they will start branching out uh, or through startups or or engaging with the local economies to find to find suppliers so uh, they are I think, sorry if i please. interrupt you That's but good. i think they do most things in-house so they don't have that much supplier mm, okay. maybe something from bosch for the for mm -hmm. the wipe wipers also but uh, they do the the motors themselves they do the battery there themselves so i don't think that they have so many uh, supplier like bmw used to have or, mm -hmm. or mercedes-benz mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well it's certainly a very interesting uh, case study to to explore and and that that based on you pointed out here it's certainly uh you can draw such a diagram such a framework for uh, for uh, the te tesla in the market i may do some research and i can bring in the next lecture to see if uh, there is already some uh, some literature or maybe even other cases of uh, uh, north american health based uh, companies trying to enter the european market and uh, it's important to understand the conditions for this entry in terms of legislation as well maybe new guidelines from the european union that facilitate facilitate or injure this this uh, strategic linkage or evolving that could hinder their evolution from a strategic linkage to a more strategic coupling uh, process yeah i think based also on partly of these uh, the, the the cultural dimensions of management studies that tell that the cultural aspects also play a role in this embeddedness uh, is 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 the 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 how tesla is currently positioned within the minds of the, cons the european consumers and the, even policy makers this will certainly also play a role in a, for them to advance uh, from a strategic linkage towards a more strategic coupling process uh, yeah, I, but I think that is certainly a very interesting, co a very interesting case study to um, to explore in a similar way as these these uh, these two researchers did for Siemens and Huawei uh, uh, two or three years ago. So they start establishing these new contracts, uh, new uh, establishing joint ventures, and fundamentally, with the case of Huawei, I don't know about uh, about Tesla. It's also important to understand that in start investing quite large amounts of money in the research uh, and developments in Europe, less than uh, less than investing in the production, in the physical production of their, their, their equipment. Uh, I couldn't find uh, an example of, of a physical a, a physical investment in terms of industry or from Huawei, but more about uh, boosting their prices in terms of research and development. So and they want to use the Europe as their second homeland after China, and then using Europe as again as a as a catapult to to their position in the international uh, international arena. They engage now more with high end activities, and they 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 try to build an ecosystem around the the Huawei goals. What is telling what the meaning of this is that 
this this researchers underline this uh, Huawei ecosystem where the shareholders, the customers, some doubts here, the suppliers are engaging 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 with the goals of Huawei and they they rely on this engagement of of uh, of uh, the multiple actors around Huawei to boost their presence in the global uh, competitive uh, arena. So number of differences here in terms of of uh, of uh, in, if we go through a comparison to other cases such as Siemens as well and uh, and uh, many other examples could be explored certainly and uh, the literature still is lagging behind in this more empirical comparison between uh, uh, the behaviors of, of enterprises within uh, embeddedness in specific local economies. And uh, the key element of the Huawei uh, steps towards the, the strategic coupling is again, relies essentially in the large investments of uh, their revenues in research and development, first in Stockholm, then a new research center in, in, the, in Finland, and then the establishing a logistics center probably all the pro, all the all the components still coming from china in my understanding but then most of the research in support of the physical production comes now from the european market from finland from the headquarters in stockholm and they still investing which is quite uh, quite uh, um, quite paramount here and, and and it should be underlined that they are investing a large amount of uh, of of their profits in research and and development and they also invest quite a lot in local procurement so local procurement um so they are using local uh, uh, labor force to support their research and development process and to support their activities in the European market. So instead of uh, seeking the uh, uh, seeking seeking talent, uh, attracting talent from elsewhere or from outside of Europe, their prime goal is to use uh, to use the workforce within the, the European market to support their technical and innovation uh, processes. And um, by taking the the case of uh, of Stockholm as a starting point, they 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 start communicating themselves through their corporate social responsibility report that you can find in their web page they they start using these 20 years of embeddedness in europe as to boost their their global their global image so they have now um, the, the um, flagship research centers the stockholm one and one other one then one other another one in germany as a, as a as a again as this starting point for their global presence um, or their global presence, and they are investing 10% of uh, their revenues in research and development, which is, again, I underline here, remarkable for the, lo the local economy. And certainly at some point, or, or even is already happening, that European institutions will start understanding this presence as, as, a, as a, an advantage for the local economies. And eventually this will facilitate their strategic coupling because the conceptualization of strategic coupling tells us that requires the satisfaction of the local needs. And based on this on these insights from this literature, I couldn't really grasp to what extent the local needs of let's call Stockholm or Nuremberg, if we understand them as the local economies, to what extent they are being satisfied. Uh, the moment that they start communicating and using communication platforms to, to, to share with the future shareholders and with the policymakers in these local economies of these urban regions and and and, uh, and, uh, and countries that they are supporting research and development. Their investment has resulted in uh, X percentage of, uh, of, uh, of job creation. They will certainly find, find an easier process to then integrate uh, with local institutions and then start satisfying more clearly uh, the local needs, uh, uh, the needs of local economies. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if this is currently being clear. They try to summarize here in this one table the differences and, and the similarities between Siemens and Huawei. And along the table, uh, that is many of the of the steps towards the strategic the first exploration and the strategic linkage, they are very similar in terms of uh, they start from a lower level or start uh, starting by providing services to a more to or to more competitive uh, markets within the, the local economy, Europe first as a local economy and then sub local economies of the European member states. Then 
the process in terms of this economic and technical ambivalence, they are very similar and the difference starts occurring more on the social and the cultural ambivalence. That's why I decided, I decided, I start to think about, not decide, I start to think about the possible reasons for these, for these um, the differences between one and another. It certainly has to do how consumers and policymakers uh, uh, position, how they position the brands uh, of Siemens and Wahai in their, in their minds and and, and it's interesting, will be interesting in terms of research to understand these cultural and social aspects hindering, uh, hindering or, or, or somehow hindering the process of uh, ambivalence of Huawei in Europe, for example. So, and here the goals are also different. Well, you see that here in the Siemens, they start, they, they, that their goal was to comply with local laws because they understand that complying with local laws of China is fundamental for their integration in the Chinese market. Here, the Huawei certainly they also uh, they also find very very uh, strong regulations, and then the, the but then the, the regulations of Euro they are well established. They per se Huawei won't be able to shape them, won't be able to shape laws in Germany or the European or at the European level. So they start by, by investing more on their uh, institutional embedness through uh, industrial ecosystems. So within the local industry. Is there any? No, I have a chat there. No, there's no intervention at the moment. So so there are some differences in this regarding that embedness within, within the institutions. And if you remember uh, now, Siemens tried to, to, to also uh, align that activity with a number of decisions from the government and, uh, and Huawei is still far from this engagement with, uh, with uh, the local institutions. And they are doing that mainly based on by investing in research and development in support of their own business and engaging with, uh, the, with, the, with local industry. So their ambivalence is slightly different in this, in this context. So the institutional ties between Siemens and China, between Siemens and the local economy are higher in comparison to Huawei and their ambivalence in the local economy slash Europe and European, uh, European market. Do you have any questions on this more empirical, empirical uh, sites? Okay, and uh, and again, maybe I will uh, I will bring uh, try to explore the case of Tesla or others to see to see if uh, uh, to see to see if also some differences in terms of their evolution or their path in terms of embedness in Europe. So again, to retain from them the strategic coupling concept concept we are talking about multinational corporations that compose these global production networks about that that integration uh, and, and, and the, the way they establish strategic linkage with the local industries and within institutions in specific local economies. So it's the extent that we can talk about a, a strategic orient or strategic innate process of establishing linkage between multinationals and local economies. And here a theoretical diagram trying to summarize a process of a strategic coupling uh, uh, of a strategic coupling and the the, the win-win um, icon here uh, is is uh, is my home so i decided to 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 include it but i also point out that is there are there is slash there are dark signs of strategic coupling as there is there are dark sides of economic geography and i will try to be more clear in the next slide so the goal is try to, to support regional development. Strategic coupling, prime goal is to support regional development. But you have, first, this won't be achieved if the enterprises, these large, these multinational corporations uh, um, are um, unable to satisfy their, uh, their, their, their needs, and these are more profit-oriented needs, and also won't be able to be achieved if as the result of this linkage, the local economies are not capable of satisfying their needs. And these needs are mainly regarding to uh, employment, uh, uh, finding support to improve infrastructures through different means, engagement in strategic planning, corporate spatial responsibility, for example. So this, this in ideal scenario or in theoretical terms, strategic coupling uh, implies a win-win situation between a multinational corporations embedded in these global production networks and the 
local economies at the regional level, and they rely on regional assets. The strategic coupling ideal also reinforces or plays a role in, in, in boosting these regional assets. So regional assets, some of them, they are embedded in a territory, they are, uh, they are intangible, others they are tangible and the result of, pure, of, of a pure public investment, but they can also be enhanced through the cooperation between uh, public and private entities. So if a strategic coupling is able to enhance or to boost, to, 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 to invest in, in the development of these regional assets understood here as, for example, investment in research and development, then we'll have a win-win situation and can ultimately then contribute to regional uh, development. And again, partly of the literature that is sympathetic to strategic coupling or the effectiveness, sympathetic towards the effectiveness, effectiveness of strategic coupling. Um, although they eventually in one or another paragraph, they underline there are dark signs or, or there are negative aspects from the strategic coupling. This is important to bear in mind when we are, for example, doing an empirical study on, on, the, on the strategic linkage or, or the emptiness of Tesla in Europe. There are certainly dark sides. Maybe there are, maybe then, then we should come Come, come with some hypothesis in the beginning. Maybe there are a number of strong private interests playing a role in the embeddedness. Maybe there are there are the network of Tesla is already uh, eventually is not uh, is not uh, on paper. Maybe maybe they have been playing an informal role in trying to enter the European market by, for example, establishing uh, um, establishing uh, networks that will favor this integration later on. Maybe now in specific uh, urban regions, they will find uh, private actors or, or, or eventually public actors that will somehow facilitate that integration in the European market. So it's important to bear in mind there are the dark signs of strategic coupling. And, uh, and uh, the literature points out that this points out more, where, more on the direction of the, what happens when something goes wrong after the strategic coupling can lead to to, to the frictions between the global production networks or between the multinational corporations and the local economy. Maybe they were expecting to boost research and development, but maybe for some reason, this is, this is, this is very difficult to, to achieve, or maybe there are external forces uh, uh, or other strong players impacting or, or blocking the, the, the a more organic evolution of this strategic coupling. So it's important also to embrace the exploration of this topic from a, from a more a more critical stance, from a more critical uh, point of view. And the dark signs, uh, they, they go from formal arrangements to the informal ones, can also be related with uh, with with corruption, for example, can also be related with with the the, the how lobby exercise and to what extent these lobbies does facilitate the embeddedness of one or another multinational in the a specific in a specific local economy, and this uh, still happening everywhere. How of however, in terms of research for, for for us, for myself, for yourselves and my colleagues to truly grasp this in reality, then it's very difficult. Um, I can give you the example, this also, this dark side, dark sides, you can find these dark sides in, in economic geography and in planning as well. And part, uh, part of these dark sides of planning, they, they, they are related to, to, uh, to the informal arrangements that exist between private actors, mainly real estate developers, while contributing uh, while participating in the plan making process. And it was always very difficult when I was doing research in, in these European urban regions to truly get from the from planners. I was interviewing planners and uh, uh, more from the technical side and a, a number of politicians uh, uh, or policy makers. It was always difficult to truly uh, to truly get from them the 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 extent of the negotiations between, for example, landowners or real estate and real estate developers and their truly involvement in the planning process. So there are a number, a number of dark sides in many of the disciplines. In economic geography, uh, uh, the dark sides are related to when, for example, and uh, innovation processes lead to uneven development, or when uh, an investment, a public investment in the, in the, in boosting the competitive 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 position of a territory, leads to uh, special inequalities, for example, and leaves people 
outside of the normal development process. So elements that is important to, to keep in mind. What is important also to keep in mind, fundamentally, when we are talking about strategic coupling from an evolution economic geography perspective, is that, that even, even in this case of Siemens and Huawei, the process seems quite clear, exploratory, strategic linkage, strategic coupling. There are moments where you may find a decoupling process or, or where a strategic coupling uh, the way it was that it was established in the beginning uh, for some reason couldn't really uh, um, gain attraction at the ground then this these local economies they enter a phase of decoupling and eventually they have to find other ways of 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 uh, seeking embeddedness in a specific in a specific territory and uh, so this is time consuming and also in many of the cases involves an, uh, involves uh, uh, um, actors that are not necessarily placed in the in the in the market or in the local economy. These multinationals trying to to uh, uh, to to be located or to to the, the markets they intend to to end to to enter. So there are a number of forces playing uh, playing a role in how a strategic coupling can really be effective uh, be effective uh, at the ground and um also part of uh, there are a number of arguments other uh, arguments be, uh, uh, along this with the dark side is that uh, there are a number of uh, of arguments telling that this can all be achieved uh, uh this this, this uh, having multinational corporations embedded in a local economy, in a way that both sides see their needs satisfied, can also be achieved without a strategic coupling. Uh, eventually, joint ventures or, or cooperation protocols, PRC can lead, can lead, can lead to this to 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 to, to um, the satisfaction of the needs of the multinational corporations and of the local economies. So there's a number of of possibilities of having this engagement in a way that is that they reach a win-win situation for the multinational corporations and and for the local economies. That 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 does not need them to to follow through a strategic uh, a strategic embeddedness or a strategic coupling process. And for example, the cases we we discussed earlier in terms of entrepreneurial region in 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 Medellin, Colombia, uh, throughout the literature you don't find you don't find the strategic coupling in relation to their developments. And then they could still enhance the research and development. They could still rely on external forces. Uh, not necessarily multi multinational corporations to boost their local needs. So uh, hope this being clear and to boost their endogenous capacity of development. This endogenous capacity of development part of the literature tells that they can achieve this without having necessarily exogenous linkage or linkage to this multinational corporation. So, and this is this is yeah different different areas here to explore. You can talk about endogenous and 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 but well, but if these multinationals they are already embedded in the market, so we are not talking about exogenous linkage yet. The air, their headquarters are located elsewhere. So to what extent we can truly talk about uh, uh, different different ways of boosting local economies without engaging with strategic coupling or without engaging with uh, with the external linkage that there's plenty of ways to explore this in terms in terms of uh, in in terms of research and the literature points out that indeed is interesting to uh, assess this uh, evolution of the uh, embeddedness of multinational corporations or global production networks in local economies because part of them they rely on legacies of the past to shape their current interventions but then i question also myself to what extent we can we can grasp the legacies of huawei and to what extent these legacies influence their 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 tentative or their efforts to entry the european market i found more found more this this evolution of the strategic coupling process more uh, an organic uh, a more a more a reaction to current demands and needs from the business from their side from the from the Huawei side more than the legacies of 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 the past so it's important to again uh, when we are exploring this in terms of research or trying to answer a question understanding there are different different vectors here to take into account that 
local economies, they can reach a level of, of development without engaging in strategic coupling. There are a number of ways to do that. And part of those ways are related with regional innovation policies. We talk about place-based one, and we talk about smart specialization later on. So, um, and um, the next three slides, I, I summarize this argumentation of, of the difference that exists. And part of the, also the literature tells that small size enterprises, they often can reach the success. But we discuss also that in this case, these small size and, and firms, they start small and they get bigger and bigger. So uh, all these multinational corporations that we we uh, that we, we we are aware of, and then they they have their headquarters in Silicon Valley. They start small, but through or the entrepreneurial state or or, or through um, a strong commitment of the entrepreneur, they could they could boost their brands and from small firms they um they 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 become transnational corporations so part of the literature such as this one suggests that that these companies these companies in the silicon valley they could find their own endogenous uh, grow process without engaging in strategic coupling with multinational corporations but then through time they evolve from small uh, small science firms to to TNCs, to transnational, uh, multinational corporations. So again, a number of factors playing a role here, not necessarily the strategic coupling, but probably all the commitments of, of, uh, of the, the commitment of the entrepreneurs, a group of entrepreneurs. And here is the, the uh, uh, an interesting summary of how this Fairchild uh, that started the a small size firm in the Silicon Valley start expanding dramatically through other domains uh, without necessarily engaging with uh, with other TNCs located uh, located elsewhere. Uh, I don't know if you are uh, grasping my my thoughts in this in this context. So you have to explore what are the reasons behind the expansion of the Fairchild in the semiconductor business, for example. Certainly, cultural elements. The the Propensity, propensity or the capacity of the entrepreneur to take risks. Uh, this has to do with cultural elements. Uh, there are a combination of approaches. Uh, certainly the knowledge flows uh, with, with the universities in, um, in the Silicon Valley or in the southern part of California. Governance arrangements, money, dollars coming from from the government intended to boost to, to continue boosting the semiconductor sector uh, in the in north america in the united states particularly and then this 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 although very much business land uh, uh, the role of the state still is still fundamental in continuing uh, in continue uh, uh, in continuing uh, the the um, or in helping small firms to become uh, multinational corporations, and the United States still intends to boost their uh, their semiconductor or their ship industry because they understand they have regional assets that can continue supporting this this industry throughout the next the coming years, and they also acknowledge that the ship industry plays a fundamental role in um, in economic growth. So then they will. They, they enter this cycle of 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 of, of uh, finding easier ways to boost their presence presence in the global economy and boost their presence in these global production networks. Indeed, they start small, as this book points out. They start small by combining different uh, different strategies, different approaches. They turn to be they turn to be multinational corporations and then because they contribute to the economic growth they still receiving or having the possibility to apply for large amounts of uh, of uh, public pu public money and then um, then we still have a couple of uh, a couple of uh, minutes here to discuss smart specialization more focus on uh, in the european union but uh, do you have any any questions at the moment Or regarding the previous slides, do you have any suggesting suggestion that that could be explored, for example, in the next lecture? Mm, something that that 
calls your attention because you read something in the news or, or, or you are more aware of what is going on, for example, in the German market that, that I could explore and bring, for, uh, uh, bring in the next lecture? You don't have to answer now, just please, uh, uh, please uh, do not hesitate to reach out. If you have some ideas, I can still incorporate in the, in the next lecture. Okay, this is partly of the scenario in, uh, in the United States and, and Europe uh, regarding regional development. So that still, that still the, the state still playing a role in continue uh, boosting uh, their regional assets or, or the industries where they are aware they are capable of uh, continuing position themselves in the, in the global competitiveness arena in, in Europe. They uh, in Europe or more or fundamentally within the European Union, they uh, they they the, the member states still relying very much on academic research to to develop their different types of regional development policies, and basically everything you you need to know about smart specialization is in this book in your whole lot. Uh, a lot uh, platform and clearly summarizes the process, the genesis of the concept of uh, smart specialization and how it came to be um, a flagship uh, uh, policy within uh, within the, the European Union. And it starts starts uh, in, a, in, in the same date than the concept of constructing regional advantage starts in 2009 and is the result of academic of academic research or, or is the result of, a, of, of a, a study requested by the European Commission to a number of, uh, of researchers uh, located in, in Switzerland, in Germany, in, um, in Belgium uh, and uh, in the UK as well. So they sit together and develop, uh, they develop uh, a report on the smart specialization strategies and how they can support regional development in Europe. The goals are very similar to those of the place-based approach. Uh, um, counteract uneven development and counteract uh, uh, regional inequalities across the European Union. Uh, but the focus of the smart specialization is on research and development and bringing about, uh, bringing about uh, means to support innovation processes within the regional econ within the local economies of the member states. Uh, similar to the example, to, to the, the meaning of this, this line here, similar to this process of the United States in investing in the ship industry, because this is part of their assets, they, they, they know they can still boost in their presence globally in this type of industry. The same goes the, in the philosophical principles of the smart specializ specialization that calls for an investment in the regional, in the potentials or in assets of these territories. The intention is to, to, to boost what they know how, how to do, to boost what the, their own capabilities. And before advancing with the, with the, towards the, the smart specialization is important to share with you that the smart specialization currently, um, now they are the, still the, the forthcoming multinational framework towards 2027, it's still uh, partly, um, partly um, agreed, but it's still under discussion, is considered, is considered a, a regional development policy, but an ex and conditionality means that smart specialization uh, is is uh, developing smart specialization strategies is a necessary condition for the member states to apply for European money, and here, European money uh, is is uh, can be translated as applying for different type of investment funds or or um, funding schemes within the European Union. So the member states member states or, or the regions that are entitled to apply, for example, for the European structural and investment funds, they need to develop a smart specialization strategy. That's what's the meaning of a, an ex ant conditionality. And it's precisely this element of the ex ant conditionality that leads to more to a number of critics towards the smart specialization, specialization strategy as a regional development policy. And uh, the European Union, of course, provides a number of guidelines uh, for the member states or, or regions within the member states to, uh, to elaborate, to design their, um, 
that uh, that uh, that uh, smart specialization strategies. The core goal is to, uh, as I try to underline here, to to boost their own strengths, and and use their strengths to create new business models to. To, to try to find new ways to uh, renew the industrial sector. And uh, the intention of these guidelines or the intention of, of taking it, this SSS uh, uh, strategies as an excellent conditionality is to avoid the duplication or fragmentation of efforts. So the goal is to, to put the regions and the members or regions within the member states in the right path of, of, of development by using smartly the resources they have by by using smartly their own capacities uh, and trying to avoid wasting of uh, waste the wasting of founding and of uh, non-renewal resources for example i'll i'll, I'll consider these these um, these philosophical principles uh, of the smart specialization strategy very 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 uh, not realistic but but uh, but um, um, that in, they favor this, this, this favor they favor sustainable development, but in practice again, uh, the, the effectiveness of these uh, uh, strategies at the ground is still very questionable. While I question less the principles, I question more the implementation. The same goes to to the literature that often questions does not question the design of the strategy. The principles are coherent. The 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 the, the the philosophical idea behind the design of the strategy, they are also very, very, um, they, they sound very promising. However, then the implementation is certainly very challenging. It's certainly very challenging to avoid the, the waste of, uh, of, uh, of resources and to avoid not investing in the, uh, in, in the same type of winners within the regional economy. So they suggest, the principles that the smart specialization policy is certainly not about planning. It's, it's, they are not calling the countries, the member states, now you only need to follow this specialization strategy. You have to seek, uh, uh, you have to, to, to implement this across, across your governance structures, across the different industrial sectors. No, they are, they, 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 the suggestion is that this is a voluntary process but if uh, the member state of the regions we offer within the member states intend to apply for this specific funding, then you have to prepare one. So on one hand, the, 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 the European Commission points out in the direction that, well, this is not a, a, a formal planning, a formal demand for you, for you member states to, to, to plan and manage your original strengths in this direction. But if you want to apply for this specific fund, then you have to come with a smart specialization strategy. You understand that this, this is here a give and take exercise, uh, uh, a give and take exercise involving the smart specialization. And again, the prime focus is in enhancing regional assets through research and uh, development. And um, what's, what's the, the, the this report on smart specialization points out is that the goal is not necessarily to ask uh, uh, regions within the European member states to be specialized uh, and forget everything else, but try to find uh, try to find ways of enhancing the the, the put that own potentials. The same uh, that's an example here that the book uh, the book I uh, I pointed out earlier suggests that is not about asking uh, Galicia we talked about this before which has an important fishery uh, fishery sector we also discussed this uh, um, before is not asking the smart special spe specialization strategy does not ask Galicia to now fully invest or only invest in the fishery sector just because it's a regional assets of the of, of the territory is about investing in areas where they can come together to boost this sector so the intention is to explore to branch out the sector fundamental through innovation processes and find ways uh, that to to multiply the benefits of this fishery sector within them within the regional uh, uh, the regional economy so the goal is not to ask member states to only specialize themselves in one specific sector, but finding ways of, 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 of boosting that specific sector, but by uh, 
branching out to other kind of uh, of uh, of activities. Uh, hopefully, this is uh, this is uh, becoming a uh, becoming a bit clear, and um, so the smart specialization is is uh, the old works as more as, as a means to achieve something else, as a means to achieve regional development, as a means to boost a specific sector by investing in research and development, by investing or by, by, by offering the possibility for these member states to invest in research and development that could complement their uh, the sectors where they have their where they hold some strengths and they can use these strengths to position themselves in comparison to other regions within the European market. Uh, but also the smart specialization uh, to be effective requires an engagement with politics. So the literature suggests that indeed we, these regions, they can access certain uh, funding schemes to boost their research and development. This will help them to position themselves in that specific uh, uh, to gain a specialization in that specific sector, not only in one core area, but having a number of activities contributing to that core sector, but requires also the engagement of politics. And this is somehow uh, of common sense. Again, if the governance of that, if that, ter if the territorial governance is not engaged, a smart specialization will certainly not be effective to bring about some change or eventually to support a, a structural change in, a, in one region is necessary to develop with a, a collective strategic vision for the territory. And here that's, that's where, based on experience I have uh, from analyzing the smart specialization strategies for Northern Portugal and for Galicia, I start finding different uh, vectors of criticism towards this uh, regional development policy is very difficult to engage all the po uh, the politicians and then the problem of uh, political life cycles is also fundamental uh, preparing a smart specialization or designing it it takes time and can can even go beyond uh, the four here of a political cycle of a, a regional administration such as the case of galicia or municipalities in northern Portugal, for example, that is, 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 is difficult to build a strategy that can hold hold for the years to come because politicians will change. Maybe they will, these politicians will come from different uh, political points of view from left or right wing and may, maybe they have other type of networks and other type of, of, uh, of uh, engagements with the private sectors that are not truly reflected on this smart specialization strategy. And then in the end also uh, for this to, to for, for a, such a strategy to to have a true impact at the ground it also requires a, a, um, the discourse around it to be strengthened within that specific territory is also very challenging uh, to convince a, a large number of private actors that the way to go is through smart sustainable and inclusive strategy. These are the three pillars of the strategy, the European 2020 strategy that was in play until the end of the last year. It still uh, playing a role in regional development while uh, the, the next uh, framework is currently being, uh, being discussed. But some of the questions that uh, often the literature points out is that uh, is, is, uh, is um, is that can really this smart specialization bring bring support a structural change in the in the in the in local economies? To what extent the the, the public and private actors will be engaged within this within within this smart specialization? That to what extent the own guidelines from the European Commission uh, are are uh, truly reflect the needs of the local economy? So a number of of uh, of elements can be can be underlined here more on the critical side of, um, of, the, of the smart specialization. The counter arguments are that, well, the smart specialization, the goal is to, to have a more smart allocation of resources, is to, to, to have a strong coordination involving different levels of governance, municipalities, regional governance, national governance, the private actors as well. So it's the, 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 the core aim is to, to, to have an overarching process of development. But again, in reality, because of these power relations that exist within a territory, the applicability of the policy is um, is um, 
is certainly very certainly very challenging. So the, the smart specialization strategy is at the core of the European 2020. And because it was a requirement for uh, member states to apply for specific funding schemes from the European uh, uh, from the European Union. It, there are numbers of, of uh, several. There are several um, smart specialization strategies across uh, across the across the European Union, but not not all of them. O only those regions uh, within the member states that intend to apply for specific funding, they are obliged to elaborate smart specialization strategy or they were obliged. I'm not fully aware about what's going to happen within the Horizon Europe that is the next uh, multinational financial framework for the European Union 2021-2027. They, they will certainly come with, again, with some specific guidelines uh, that, 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 that will apply to the member states or, and then to the regions within the member states that intend to apply for funding. And I'm not truly sure at the moment, I think it's still very premature to talk. Maybe, uh, maybe in June, maybe in July, they will come with more clear guidelines. So I'm still still waiting to see if the idea, the principles of smart special specialization will still remain valid within the forthcoming multi-annual multi uh, financial framework that will be called Horizon, uh, Horizon Europe. So uh, the idea of the of elaborating these strategies was to respond to the three pillars of uh, the Europe 2020: smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. So the structural funds. Uh, then everything was the idea was to align everything within the European 2020: the structural funds and what goes in within uh, within, uh, within the the smart specialization. So they call for an, for for the incorporation of research. And innovation research and the well and an innovation um, uh, programs and objectives, and also to 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 propose a number of measures capable of boosting the information and communication technologies across uh, across Europe. So uh, so that's this this partly of the kind lines asking uh, uh, that that where uh, the member states were asked to comply with to the point that uh, a platform physical and digital was created to support the member states to elaborate their smart specialization strategies is so-called the smart specialization uh, platform that uh, that is hosted by the joint research center located in uh, Sevilla in Spain and uh, the the intention is to support uh, the, the the member states uh, to elaborate their smart specialization strategies but currently, this platform engages with a number of, of, of activities. They organize a, a conference and they have their own studies on how, uh, one, on one hand, bringing together examples uh, or good practice of uh, smart specialization and how uh, this, this, uh, this policy can, develop, can be developed forward to try to accommodate the grand societal challenge that we discussed uh, earlier, mainly those related with environmental sustainability. So now there is a, a, a sort of, of a number of studies trying to pave the way for, uh, the, for the 4S strategy where the traditional investment in research and development will be then aligned with the sustainability principle. So um, activities more related to uh, green entrepreneurship that we discussed earlier, um, research and, uh, and development more focused on uh, finding alternative energies, uh, uh, energy supply, uh, energy supplies will be uh, that they will be more supported forward within the, within the next European framework, and I forgot completely to make a to make a break here. And now we have only less than fifteen minutes. I think I will carry one if you don't mind. So I, I suggest uh, I suggest a, a number of critics here regarding this implementation of the of the smart specialization strategy is related to to. To, to this, to, to the guidelines that the European Union proposed for the countries, which question which makes myself questioning the truly aims of the of the strategy and also a number of researchers and that they're still wondering about can we still call this smart specialization strategy a place based innovation policy to the extent they are they they are a number of guidelines in telling that well. 
your region should become smarter, your region should become inclusive, and your region should become uh, um, sustainable. Well, this this brings brings some questions, and it brings some questions in terms of, of the applicability. And if if the uh, if if the regions are not uh, have not enough critical mass. To, to 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 boost these domains, uh, these three pillars of the of the European 2020 strategy, uh, are the guidelines intended to to su truly support territorial development, or they are intended to to work more as a, as a as a to they will work more to satisfy the European Commission, so then then the countries can apply can apply for, for European uh, funding. Based on again on my own research conducted between 2012 and 2015, some of the findings of this research led me to argue that partly of these uh, regions, such as the northern Portugal, considered still a lagging behind region and Galicia, they start elaborating their smart specialization strategies more with the goal of applying for the founding than with the ultimate goal of securing. Uh, livelihoods, boosting employment, or supporting or truly supporting the regional development, regional development, because they couldn't find other ways of founding a certain a certain projects. They they were, I clearly write this in one of the publications. They were forced to prepare these smart specialization strategies by pointing out the prime uh, the prime elements of the guidelines to be able to apply for the for the. Uh, uh, structural funds of the European Union, and at the end, indeed, uh, we can identify a number of uh, research centers that were created. Uh, 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 they could boost employment in certain in certain areas, but a number of uh, the winner takes all situation can also be identified. So again, this smart specialization led more to the grow of already established enterprises. Uh, or firms or industrial sectors in comparison to many others. The, 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 the supporting the entrepreneurship was still still uh, still very 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 difficult difficult to reach in these uh, in these uh, in some of the regions because of the institutional context. The goal of the smart specialist is not necessarily to boost the governance or the institutions that are governing the, the territories, but more supporting the research and development intended to uh, with the intention of this leading to new business activities within the, the region. So the question is about uh, is about to what extent the smart specialization strategy are truly able to support a structural change and uh, uh, within um, within uh, within these uh, European unions. The prime goal was indeed to 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 support this structural change by finding ways of renewing industrial sectors, of finding new paths of development, of development. But at the present, although this this smart specialization platform points out good practices in overarching terms of regional development, is in is very difficult to grasp if these uh, uh, smart specializations actually called uh, called shape a structural change in these uh, in these uh, territories. And uh, what I'm pointing out here is the uh, examples, the the three main principles of the smart specialization. How they, uh, how we can disentangle these uh, smart specialization stretches. We can, we can disentangle it as uh, as being first. Its applicability at the ground can happen in a more organic manner. Means that that there is there is founding going uh, from the European Union to these regions and in a more organic process, although strategic, uh, they can boost entrepreneurial activity, they can generate, uh, for example, industrial cl clusters and eventually support a structural change. So this can happen without having a specific policy, a specific regulation telling, well, you have to do this and that in this specific direction. So both situations are possible. But again, well, the principles tell that these situations can happen in a more organic manner or a more policy-oriented manner. However, these regions that are less developed, they don't have access to funding schemes. If they really want to bring to 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 um, implement these uh, these uh, strategies, they need to develop it once it becomes a policy. And then, in the end, in the end, 
enterprises and the research and development entities, they are being asked to invest in this and in that sector because it's aligned with a smart specialization strategy. Otherwise, they won't be able to apply for, for specific funding. The three main components of a smart specialization strategy are the entrepreneurial discovery. So the ultimate goal is to boost entrepreneurship within the region is to support the creation of new business and their entry in the market, eventually leading to the agglomeration economies, cluster formation, for example, and then ultimately support a structural change going from one type of industry to another one, more sustainable, more economically sustainable towards time. But again, this can also happen in a more organic manner. Examples far beyond the, the the year 2009. So we have cases in Lyon, for example, where an entrepreneur, because of the commitment and the capacity of discover ways, uh, they, they called lead new processes of, uh, they, they call discover new ways of dealing with a certain product or providing a certain service and then called boost, called boost a structural change. We have the case in Lyon uh, where this entrepreneur, Pierre Cassou, called transform the use of nails into the into glasses and this, this is the, the some of the prime the the, the first uh, uh, first glasses and new start being developed in uh, in the surrounding uh, in the surrounding area of 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 Lyon or in the northern part of uh, of of Geneva in Switzerland so not the result of a policy but of an organic process of the out of the capacity of an entrepreneur the same goes to other cases in Europe for example another one case in, a, in the northern part of Lisbon in the in the Atlantic coast of Portugal where also again because of the role of an entrepreneur he called find ways to transform uh, 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 molds, these these uh, these uh, yeah molds of uh, for glass making, molds used to produce uh, different uh, glasses for different type of pur purpose. This entrepreneur travel around Europe and start they start discovering the plastic, and then because the glass uh, the glass became uh, entered the, um, a process of uh, of decay, he he was able to use the uh, know how of of uh, of uh, of uh, preparing these molds for glass and using them to start producing plastic. And then this led to a complete structural change in this uh, uh, municipality of Marinha Grande that, that went from the production of, of glass to the production of plastic. Many elements here in terms of sustainability can now be pointed out. That's not the point of, of, of the lecture. So also through an organic process without a policy and because of the of the capacity of uh, this entrepreneurial discovery capacity of this specific entrepreneur, uh, the 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 local economy of Mar of Marinha Grande called uh, called evolve from a, a simple entrepreneurial discovery of uh, of using the uh, the um, molds to produce glass to start producing plastic. This is a type of. Uh, of a uh, mold user to produce this type of, uh, of, of uh, plastic boxes. So we can find the three pillars of smart specialization without having a policy. And I think that is the beauty of the concept that some of these, uh, of these elements can be reached without having a guideline from the multinational, from a multinational, uh, uh, multinational uh, organization such as the European Union. On one hand, I, I, um, I, I, agree that for lacking behind regions, funding is necessary, but also more than providing uh, funding, uh, direct funding is also necessary to boost their critical, their critical mass. And maybe through endogenous process, they can go from a simple entrepreneurial discovery, discovery to truly support a structural change in their uh, territories. Um, other examples is, is, uh, can be found across Europe. In this case is the, a group of Finnish entrepreneurs. They could, they could transform the pulp and paper companies by inc start incorporating nanotechnologies in the process, also through an organic process. And indeed, as a result of a strong commitment involving this, this group of entrepreneurs and, uh, and uh, the, the increase of spending in research and development uh, by the pulp and the paper companies. And again, uh, the success of this case 
points out in the direction that a lot can be achieved if entrepreneurs work together with institutions. So we have a combination here of an evolutionary process with a relational geography, with a relational geography uh, uh, conceptualization. So together they could implement and bring this nanotechnology uh, to the production of pulp and paper. So we can have new domains, new paths and in business coming in this organic ma manner without having having this uh, this uh, influence of a specific of a specific policy the goal of the of the smart specialization as a as an ex ante conditionality was to boost all this process entrepreneurial discovery the entry and the structural change so the element of entrepreneurship plays a fundamental role in, uh, in, the, in the effectiveness of the smart specialization process, which can happen also through different factors, through transition, modernization, diversification, and, uh, and uh, less known, the radical change. And, uh, and we, reach the, we reach the time limit. I just want to go through, um, then the next, the next uh, lecture, I will bring the structural change that could happen through uh, organic and policy oriented smart specialization strategy. And uh, a number of examples will, uh, will help us to solidify the ultimate goal of this uh, smart specialization strategy. And I will conclude uh, the, the lecture here. And uh, it was again, uh, I know a bit, a bit heavy. Uh, hopefully the literature will help you to, to grasp the the the, re, the some of the the components of this of this region development policy. Do you have any question? Nope. At no any intervention at the moment. Okay. Then if not, I will see you next Tuesday for our for our lecture last lecture. I will bring. Uh, uh, a number of conclusions on the smart specialization, then uh, then will help us to understand uh, other type of alternatives to these more more mainstream uh, regional development policies, such as degrow, slow innovation, which which point out more in this way of uh, in this more endogenous capacity of local economies to find their uh, regional development uh, paths, and uh, and circular economy. So concepts that are currently uh, being debated quite intensively across a number of disciplines, in, including economic geography. So I wish you a good rest of the week and a nice weekend. See you on Tuesday. Bye-bye. Thank right. you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.